Your mind is limitless. The possibilities are endless. Awaken Your Mind Magic shows you how you can dream limitlessly and live your life on a new level. Susan Kathleen speaks with ordinary people who are living extraordinary lives using the power of their minds. Abundance, prosperity, and success. There are no limits to what you can dream. Join Susan Kathleen on a journey into your dreams, making a difference and living life on your own terms. This is Awaken Your Mind Magic. Hello and welcome everyone. My guest speaker today is Gulda Wiaka, all the way from Colorado, USA. And here I am in Brisbane, Australia. She's considered one of today's foremost experts on ancient shamanic principles. And Gwilda has studied shamanism for over 40 years. She's been a practitioner for 30 years and a teacher of the shamanic arts since 1996. She is the host of the radio show Mission Evolution that broadcasts through the X-Zone Broadcasting Network, where she dedicates her life to sharing the latest scientific and spiritual information through multimedia in order to bring unity and enlightenment to an evolving world. Gulda is the author of five books, one of which is including, so we're still here, now what? Spiritual evolution and personal empowerment in a new era, which won first runner-up of the Cover Visionary Awards Alternative Science Division. Amongst her many accomplishments was the founder and director of Path Home Shamanic Arts School, a Colorado State Certified and Occupational School of the Shamanic Arts, and is a preceptor of the University of Colorado's School of Medicine, where she provides instruction to medical doctors on the modern interface between shamanism and allopathic medicine. She's an international speaker teacher, healer, and author. And wow, welcome, Gulda. It's wonderful to have you with us here on Awaken Your Mind Magic. Well, thank you so much for having me. I really appreciate it, and I look forward to sharing with you and your audience. Well, I appreciate the time, and I'm going to let the audience know we have to do a second recording because my alarm went off because I'm in your tomorrow. And you're in my (laughs) yesterday. And my alarm went off to let me know that this was the important time to speak to Gulda and we had to start all over again. (laughs) So tell us about your story, Gulda. What makes you want to see the world full of joy and positivity? We know what I'd really like is to see the world to come back into balance. Um, It's been out of balance for a long time, and we're starting to reap the rewards of that, I think, and with what we're looking at with COVID and riots and on and on and on and all the uproar. Um, And, you know, there, there needs to be balance brought back, and this is kind of a correction we're going through. So I really want to be able to be supportive as we weather this correction storm in order to bring balance back to the planet. I hear what you say there as well. And when we have people like you who understand these laws and deal with the fields of quantum physics and metaphysics, the, the interest is that the more you speak about it and you teach about it, the more people will realize that this is the way that we should be moving. And it is very tragic with all of these riots and things going on. It should not be happening. And I, I empathize with you there over, over in the States because it's, it's not a good place to be. And I trust that you are safe and well with both combination of COVID-19 and what's happening currently. Gwilda, yes, I am. I'm yeah. safe and well. Thank you. Yeah, I'm really pleased to hear that, Gwilda, because you are such a powerhouse as well, and you are in the most incredibly innovative woman. You've done so much in the line 
of shamanism. Could you define shamanism? Sure. The way I look at shamanism now, this isn't the normal definition, but it's it's viewed by most as a mystical, magical practice that's mostly superstition and sleight of hand. And that's what it's become viewed at because it's been viewed from the outside looking in and because, as we'll speak about later, it's gotten dogmatic over the years. But really, shamanism in its purest form is an organized set of rituals that enables the practitioner to focus their natural ability to manage matter at the quantum level. And of course, the quantum level is what we're going to be calling the spiritual level. They're one and the same. It's where the push-pull of life begins before things make manifest physically. If you can affect a change or read what's going on there, it gives you a heck of an edge on figuring out how to run your life. When people zone towards shamanism and they start to work in that line of running their life that way, what are the changes that happen when these things, when people take shamanism on as, as a, a way of living. It is absolutely a way of life. And one of the first things that starts to happen is you start to recognize all the places in your life that you're living out of balance with the way life works. And so that requires a lot of introspection and honesty and process in the ancient forms, there were these shamanic initiations, that were, some of them were actually brutal, in order to shatter a person's old way of being to open them up to the new way of life. And fortunately, we don't have to go through those, but we do have to go through our process, through being honest with ourselves, through looking at our patterns, and through choosing to change them so we can better align with the way life works. Could you explain to me how long ago or or when shamanism started to happen was it from the time of creation and there are different forms of shamanism because i know of celtic shamanism and um you know the various other be- beliefs and the practices are they one and the same or do they come from different lineages Yes and yes. Okay. So (laughs) shamanism is found at the base of every nationality. You follow any nationality far enough back, you'll find an earth-based and at some point a galactic-based shamanic practice. It's between 50 and 60,000 years old that we know of, I would suspect older. And it's the way people aligned with the planet and the stars in order to find safe passage. There's examples where during the tsunami we had a while back, where this, this island was absolutely inundated and people went there to try to rescue, but they figured the natives were probably gone um, because the tsunami just washed over the whole place. But they happened to have a shaman that had them get to the top of a mountain and not a person was lost because he could read the currents of life. And so we've been doing this for so long. Um, And there is, like you say, every nationality. Well, down there, you've got Aboriginal shaman. We've got Native American shaman here in the States. But there's Tibetan shaman. There's core shamanism. There's um, you know, Celtic shamanism, it's all over the planet and has been for 60,000 years. You say the base belief is in um, galactic. Is, is that from explain, if you, can, if you can let me know and let the audience know, what is the galactic connection? So just about every shamanic practice that I know about, whether it's the Celts or the Native Americans or the Aboriginals, really believe they originally came from the stars. You'll find that. Um, So I'm not sure if they feel like their bodies came from the stars or if like part of their spirit came from the stars and then they incarnate here. It's very interesting. I mean, even um, the Kachina dancers um, actually were originally dancing to embody a star being to bring forth information. Now, our, I'm going to get a little complicated here, but our planet moves in and out of higher frequency areas of the galaxy. When we go into the lower frequency areas of the galaxy, there's less light to see by. And so our understanding is becomes more limited and we become more earth-based and a little more dogmatic because we don't have the big view. And those are in the ages, the darkest would be in the ages of Scorpio and the age of um, Taurus. But when we're in the age of Leo, 
or as we're moving into the age of Aquarius, we're coming into a part of the galaxy where there's more luminosity or brightness. This excites the heliosphere of the sun, bringing in more luminosity and brightness to the sun, which then comes out from its toroidal field and interacts with that of the earth. So pretty soon we're being bathed in much higher frequency, which gives us a much broader range of interconnectedness. This was the form of galactic shamanism that was during the time that the pyramids were built, these structures that we can't even reproduce today. So there's a lot of magical things that happened the last time we were in the era of light, and I really feel that it's a shamanic connection. Also, the Mayan calendar was developed uh, clear back when they had no, not even so much as a telescope, and yet the Mayan calendar is accurate because it's based on the interrelated, interrelationship between galactic movement. They had no way of seeing that galactic movement except through shamanism. And then you look on the, the you look at the way they were studying it. It's more like they got this information and then were trying to figure it out. They were mathematician and shaman. And so the, the Mayan calendar was actually, I believe, information that came from the stars through shamanic means to us. That's fascinating. When when you explain this the way you have, would you say that the current affairs that are happening worldwide have something to do with us leading into the age of Aquarius? Absolutely, because there's, you know, everything expresses according to frequency. If we're living in lower frequency times, all of our structures build around a more limited viewpoint, a more limited frequency. When we come into higher frequency times, increasing pressure is brought to bear on the old structures. So this higher frequency is being fed into the sun, through the sun, it's being fed into the earth, it's being fed even into the earth's core and then coming out and emanating around us. So it's coming down from the sun and out from the earth and we're sandwiched in between. What starts to happen is all the old realities start to shatter and fail, and it creates chaos before a new order can be formed. Unfortunately, that's what we're looking at right now. When you explain that, it leads me to ask you, the people in place who are creating the chaos, would they have had a sacred contract prior to coming and being rebirthed at this time to be able to, to, to be part of the enabling of this process? That's a larger question than I have knowledge for, but I would suspect that you're correct. We each come with a purpose, and if it's bringing chaos, well, maybe that's the purpose. But chaos, we know, has to happen. So the old structure fails before the new one can form. There was this experiment done years and years and years ago by a musician. This is in the 1800s. And what he did was he took a plate of sand and he ran his bow across it. And he would create a particular note by running his, his bow, like his violin bow, but I think it was a cello, yeah. across the plate of sand. The plate of sand would go into absolute chaos, but then if he held that note, it would form a kaleidoscope repeating pattern that would maintain until he changed the note. Then when he would change the note to another frequency, all the sand would absolutely go into chaos again. But if he held it long enough, a unique uh, uh, kaleidoscope form would show up that was different than the last. If he would go back to the last note, the same formation came up as when the last time he played it. So this shows how our reality, our physical reality, expresses according to frequency. And when you change frequency, there's chaos in between before the new pattern can form. So, it all sh so what happens is it shatters in order to be able to recreate. Is, is that what, is that what I, my understanding is? Yes, we're breaking things back down to their constituent parts to be repurposed for a new format. When you talk about that experiment with sand, um, I've heard say that if beautiful music is played to water um, and you drink that, it's, it, it's really good for you. Would, would you say that every element is part of the quantum energy field? Absolutely it is. It's, it begins at the quantum energy field and then manifests according to its frequency. So if we provide, just like with the note on the cello, cello bow on, bowl, cello bow on the sand, um, bowl of sand, that what happens at the quantum level sounds a tone or a frequency that matter then forms around. 
As we move into different areas of the galaxy, we have more access or less access to expansive frequency. So now that we're moving into a higher frequency or more broad band frequency in the galaxy, we have a lot more options and the old ways are kind of disintegrating. It's mind blowing. <laughs> it's, and, it's ex- <laughs> and it's exciting at the same time, Gwilda, because we, we feel there is this transition and there is this awakening. And that's what awakening your mind magic is all about, is understanding exactly what you're speaking about. And teachers like you are so important at this time for us to be able to move into this field. Your shamanic teachers include practitioners and elders from numerous countries and traditions. Can you, can you um, let us know more about that? Sure. Um, my first teacher was Lakota, and um, I studied with him for, oof, he was my lifesaver, by the way. I studied for him, I think, close to eight years before he crossed. But then I felt like I, there was more I needed to know. Um, I've always been driven. I knew I had to have this information. And uh, so I started studying with different different elders. So I studied with Choctaw, Arapaho, Navajo, um, and then I started branching out and went to um, Celtic shamanism, Tibetan shamanism, and then I studied core shamanism with Michael Harner's group for a little bit. But what I found is like what Michael Harner found, and he was an anthropologist, is they have amazing things in common. Like the Aborigines, they, they, the Aboriginals were isolated there down under where you're at (laughs) for years and years and years and years. And yet their practices are very much the same as the people on this continent were way back then and are now. So there's some kind of interconnectedness that the shamanic practice taps into. And that would be the earth and stars. So Mama Gaia, uh, Father God, all of that has created this um, unilateral, unilateral, um, understanding because it makes me think of Stonehenge and then mm-hmm. I, I love and adore New Zealand and the Maori people. They, they, they all are very, very similar, but not similar. So that makes sense when you explain that as well. Would you say Would- that the meridians in the earth field has, have something to do with the similarity of these, these shamanisms. Yes, the meridians certainly play into it. And, of course, our, we know our meridians are changing now, as it are the poles, okay, um, during this whole time that we're in transition. But there's this thing known as the unified field. And as we come into higher frequency eras, which is that's when shamanism was here last time and really strong, um, we're more able to access the unified field. And the unified field is accessed where everybody's electromagnetic field crosses that of something else, X points are created. Now, this is actually a scientific fact. NASA is out there exploring X points that are created between the electromagnetic field of the Earth and that of the sun. And what they found is they create wormholes, short, short stops or short spaces between time and space. Of course, they're trying to catch one and jump into it, which isn't working for them very well, I guess. But this is the vehicle that shaman have used for millennia to journey from, that's why they use the elements. They can journey across the continent. They can do by location. That's the, the mechanism that they use. Now, I believe that that mechanism can be used for interstellar as well as inner earth and inner species. So that means transcendental um thought patterns and things is what takes you through that? Um, actually, it's it's driven by the heart. Um, the heart is what, uh, that's why the, the Native Americans and all uh, your other shamanic people say you have to have the head and the heart working together, that I see with my heart, I hear you with my heart. Because the heart pumps blood, but it doesn't just pump it, it spirals it, it pumps it in a spiral configuration through the veins. Now, medical science has come up with suddenly realizing that the heart is not capable of pumping blood back to and from the heart. So they say, well, the muscles then pump it back through the veins. Well, no, actually what happens is the heart spirals the blood through the arteries. And then it's that spiral configuration that carries it. And then, of course, it's brought back by the musculature moving. But what happens when the blood is spiraled is the red blood cells have iron in the center, just exactly like the Earth's iron core. The Earth's electromagnetic field is generated by her spinning around her iron core. 
our electromagnetic field is generated through the heart, spiraling the blood through the body. So the connective point is not through the mind, it's through the heart. And so we can, we can do the practice, we can do it with our mind, we can get some understanding, but if we really want to transcend and move through the X points, we have to be able to drop into our heart and come from there. So are you saying that we are not earthbound, that our, the bodies that we have at the moment are not really physical as well, that we have the same elements as, as earth and as energy? Absolutely. And earth is an organism and we're part of her body. So as so with every species, and that's where the imbalance has happened is, is humanity has divorced herself from that unity and chaos is the result. So it's time for us to really move into the age of Aquarius, really understand the beauty from the heart and what we really are here on this earth to do, and that is to create peace. And love. To hold, yeah, to hold that frequency of love, so that we can enter the unified field again. That's fantastic. Now, I picked up on you saying earlier on that one of your first teachers was your savior, or was your was was what helped you. Where were you at the time when you started to move into shamanism? Shamanism, and what was the reason? For you to become fascinated with this? Well, I was desperate. <laughs> um, I was born very, very um, empathic, if you will, real sensitive. And then I lived in a very volatile situation where I had to know what was going on around me to avoid whoever was going to pop off, ne- pop off next, right? So I turned up my sensitivity so that I could sense <laughs> when people were getting unsettled and, you know, kind of go hide. Unfortunately, I didn't know where the volume was. And so I was so sensitive to everybody's everything, I couldn't tell what was mine and what was somebody else's. And by the time I was in college, um, living in a dorm, and of course that was a casual of the 60s and 70s, everybody was doing hallucinogenics, not me. I was was there already. Uh, But, you know, there's all this bleed through going on. I was really starting to fail. I was in fight or flight all the time. I wasn't digesting well. Um, I was starting to have anxiety attacks. At this young age, I was like 22. And I was work, putting myself through college. I was working at a truck stop at the n- nights, evenings. Yeah. And one evening it was raining. And um, I was closing it down, closing down for the night. And this old couple came up out of the rain. And she had a scarf on and, you know, they knocked on the door because I'd locked it. And they told me that their, their truck had broken down. And this is in the day and age. There's no cell phones. There's a payphone inside. And so... Um, they asked if they could use the payphone. And I said, of course, of course, come on in. And so he uses the payphone and then they, they start to walk outside. And I said, well, do you have a ride? And he says, my brother will be here in 30 minutes. I said, it's going to take me that long to shut down. And you know, there's no reason for you to stand in the rain. Here, sit down. There's some coffee left. Have some coffee. So they sat down. They're very quiet. And they were a Native American couple, an old couple. And um, so then I noticed I had a piece of pie I was going to have to throw out. So I cut it in half and gave them each half the piece of pie. And they ate that. And they were very quiet. And then they're, they're, finally their brother pulled, his brother pulled up in another pickup out front. And they got up and they were leaving. And he turned around and he put, my, put his hand out. I thought he was going to shake my hand. So I put my hand out to him. And instead he put this crumpled up napkin in it. And he says, you'll need this use it, turn around, walked away. So after he left, I looked at the napkin and scribbled in, in a pencil was a phone number. So I thought that was odd. I put it in my purse and went on about my business. But about a week later, I was desperate. I couldn't sleep. Things were getting so much worse for me. Vietnam War was raging. Um, you know, the energy of the planet was not good. And I was privy to it all. And so I, I called that number. And uh, I started studying with him on the reservation. Every weekend I could get away. In exchange, I'd bring coffee and sugar and I'd chop wood, carry water, do all the the work I could. And he trained me for a lot of years. And he trained me how to find the volume by using the shamanic practice, how to find the volume so that I could feel the things that were taking me out, but also use my gift to access what I needed when I needed it. And that's where it all started. That's fantastic. So that that was your awakening. And yes, we, it really was. Yeah. Mm-hmm. So we 
we all have that awakening. We have the ability for it. One has to be able to recognize it. And when you speak about yourself as an empath, I can, I can empathize because I'm one of those <laughs> as well. Um, there is this, as, as a child, when you're growing up, there's this total confusion where you cannot cope at times because there's all this sort of information coming in from everywhere. Would that be an explanation of being a star child or a galactic being? I suspect so, because, you know, the children we see coming in now are extremely sensitive. There's a lot of talk about the indigos, the rainbows, yes. the, you know, the crystal children. And I had a couple of indigos myself challenging. Um, but the, the problem that I had coming in was that nobody else made any sense whatsoever. The planet made sense, life made sense, but people didn't. They didn't make sense to me at all. And that's the hallmark I see of these kids coming in now. It's like they are systems busters because this isn't working for them. You know, no. <laughs> we're labeling them ADD, ADHD, drugging them in droves. But basically, these kids came wired for tomorrow. I call them children of tomorrow. They are the children of tomorrow. In fact, I reckon they're moving into today because we need them desperately. So once more and more of us speak about our children of tomorrow, we'll be able to understand them better. And as you say, not label them as Asperger's or ADHD or any of these things, because they are unique. They are here for a reason. They're, they're blessed children. I have um, shamanic classes, actually, that I teach ch these special children. I've been doing it for years. Now I'm getting ready to get some to put up online because they, they're just so gifted this way. And when you give them these tools, they can then deal with the rest of the world, kind of like what happened with me. Well, they totally do. And um, thank goodness for what you're going to be doing, because at least then they can have a niche and understand that they're not, that there's nothing disabled or wrong about them. They, they're just incredibly unique, and we need them at the moment, right now. We absolutely do. Yeah, the problem's not with them. The problem's with us. With certain people, yes, <laughs> certainly. <laughs> <laughs> oh, dear. Wilke, okay, your online galactic shamanism classes, can you talk more about them as well and explain galactic shamanism further? I mean, we've touched on it already, but let us know because I know lots of people are going to be coming to you after this, hearing this podcast. <laughs> So galactic shamanism, um, to me, is we now have the opportunity to unify heaven and earth, um, mind and heart, heaven and earth, everything's yes. are starting to come together. And um, the Stonehenge, the mounds, the pyramids, the, the, the snake forms a, um, a shadow on, all of these things were designed to keep track of the seasons and where we are in the stellar alignment in order to balance heaven and earth within the people. Okay, this is a skill that is almost forgotten, but it's been universal. To this day, the Lakota go do a, a holy walk, um, you know, around the, um, uh, in the Black Hills, the Holy Land, and they do ceremony. Specific tri um, members of their tribe have come through lineages that are aligned with specific star systems, and they have passed down these, these, um, rituals for generations and each goes to their sacred site and performs that that ceremony um, once a year to realign the people with heaven and earth and so i have uh the first class is called the medicine wheel training but what it is is it teaches us how to align ourselves with the electromagnetic field of the earth and with the stars during different you know auspicious times of year how to build your own medicine wheel and so it starts to empower your life with the balance rather than the imbalance of humans but with the balance of heaven and earth it's amazing the changes that start to happen in your life when you engage in and that's just the first class the second class teaches you how to do the shamanic journey 
how to go into the shamanic trance and interpret information. The third one, how to create sacred space in your home, and it goes on and on. I'm uh, right now, in fact, tomorrow I'm going to finish up the fourth class, which is about power animals helping spirits and shape shifting. So these these are not uncommon uh, teachings for shamanism, but what I'm doing different is bringing in the heaven and the earth concepts and how we can bring balance back to ourselves, to our families, to our planet by, by this practice. That's fin- oh, it's fascinating. Honestly, it's just my it, I, I'm I'm loving this interview. <laughs> <laughs> oh. You mentioned that the frequency we expose to from the Earth and galactic sources impact reality. You you've spoken about that, but would you be able to explain that further to me to the yeah. listeners? Yeah, you bet. So I I like to use an analogy. Those are always fun. So say we're all sitting around a candle in a large auditorium, but we've been there for generations around, you know, circled around this little tiny candle and the light only goes just a little ways, just barely kind of to the edge of our circle. And that is our reality. And then someone comes in and turns on the gym lights. That's what's happening right now. We have based our reality, our belief systems, our behaviors on this little limited concept of all that is, and the lights are coming up, and we're realizing, well, I thought that was true, but that was only partial truth. Another analogy I like to use is, remember, I don't know if you ever made a flip book, but if you take all these still photographs and you line them up, you can make any story out of them you want to, but if you put them together in a flip book and it starts motion like a moving picture, then it makes a different story, okay? So somebody might have their hand up. Are they going to strike somebody? Are they reaching up? Are they going to go caress? You can make any story out of that you want to. But when you add motion, which is what higher frequency does, it adds a a more dynamic, then you get a fuller picture of what's really going on. And you have to adjust your reality accordingly or stick your head in the sand and really go into denial. It's like Walt Disney creating that because he created from from imagination, further imagination, through his creation of moving flip books or movies. So that that is a very good way of understanding what what our reality is as well. So when you speak to me about that, what what are the emerging emerging scientific principles as well behind shamanism when you explain that? Yes, it things shamanism is the face of shamanism is absolutely changing as a result. Because like I said, we thought of it as a dogmatic, you know, ritual, sleight of hand, um, uh, airy fairy. Yeah. Um, but actually when we start to recognize that shamanism is designed to work at the quantum level, making changes, making shifts, bringing back balance, which actually can change outcome. And it can work in the quantum level of person, place, or thing. So we, through the shamanic practice, can not only change our personal lives, but we can start to help the world find its balance. And like I said, this medicine wheel ritual, I have medicine wheels now activated all over the globe that's starting to hold a grid to bring the earth back into balance. We have amazing power in our hands, but we have to be able to sit back, let go of our old belief systems and recognize our potential. We certainly do. I mean, so in other words, with personal empowerment, using shamanism would be able to move towards what you've explained there. Can, can you go further into that? Um, help me with your question. So how can shamanism support personal empowerment mm, okay. as well? Beautiful, beautiful. Because our belief systems have us trapped in limitation. Oh, I can't do that because I'm not smart enough, or I can't do that because I'm a girl, or I can't do that because I'm poor, on and on. This is just the real mundane stuff, right? But if we embrace um, shamanism and start to do the soul searching that's required in order to move into a shamanic way, we start to recognize the lockdown places in ourselves that limit us. It's not the world. It's, It's not our gender. It's not our nationality. It's our belief systems. 
And we have formed physical, emotional, mental, and restrictions around that. And it's been passed down for generations too. So there's such a thing in my private practice I work with that's genetic upgrades because now we have the frequency to start actually shifting those old lockdown genetics that have been passed on for generations. So all of this creates personal empowerment. It will allows us to access greater bandwidths of frequency and create from there rather than from our limitation. So you say with with the um, with genetics as well, everything that's happening to each one of us individually is cause and effect from our lineage from the past. Yes, it's absolutely part of the soup. Now, of course, there's stuff going on in the present, but you know, I think we're with epigenetics, we're starting to realize more and more and more and more how much we actually came in with by being born into a particular line. And that's why we see these tendencies in different races. You know, the Jewish people have been oh, victimized forever, okay? Mm -hmm. and, and the Polish people have been driven out and starved to death and on and on and on and on. And there's this wounding that goes on that then is carried even though a person wasn't in the Holocaust, when I'm working with people, I can almost recognize they've had uh, heritage from there because the damage is still there. The wounding is still there. And if we've been carrying this for generations, but now we have the frequency to shift it and heal it, it can change the whole picture of our nationality and of our personal lives. So the more people who are aware of um, being born into a family and what they've almost been indoctrinated with from from childhood creates their reality. And that can be changed by somebody visiting you. Yes, it can. Um, I With a caveat in that there's no point jumping into that until you've done a fair amount of work on the personal level, because you can't encompass the the genetic healing if you haven't done personal healing. So you have to bring your frequency up through personal healing in order to embrace the next level, which would be your genetic healing. And I see this whole process as the future because right now we're seeing our races are having trouble living together. I mean, the clash that we're seeing because of immigration and this and that, and we're still dealing with it from, from when the, the black people were brought over here and enslaved. The damage yeah. is still there. We're still living it. Um, but as we're able to, as individuals, heal enough to be able to then address that in our lineage, we can start reaching the place where we can let that go and join the unified field. And I believe that's the only way we're going to find peace. I, I agree with you 100%. And I believe when you speak about our indigos and crystal children, they will be the salvation of all of this as well. I, I'm with you. I'm absolutely with you. But we have to make space for them. They can't do it alone. No, they can't. And we can't keep on branding them with these special names because that's not where it really is. The fact is it's us who don't understand them. Exactly. Exactly. <laughs> you speak of dogma. You spoke about, touched on that earlier, mm -hmm. and, and how it's influenced shamanism. What do you mean by that? Well, actually, dogma has influenced everything. I remember how I spoke about how we have these ages. Some of them are in a area, their age or time is simply relative positioning in the galaxy. That's what the Mayan calendar is built on. That's what our days and nights just traveling around on our, on our little planet yeah. is built on. So it's all about relative positioning. And just like when the sun comes up, there's a lot of light. When the sun goes down, there's not much light. There's more warmth when it's up. There's more cold when it's down. Well, if we look at this galactically or intergalactically, as we move through these cycles in the galaxy, which are mapped more by the ages or by the Mayan calendar, and we're coming into an era where there's less light to see by. We're going back to that candle in the auditorium place, okay? At first, when we're in the light... Okay, there's, um, we have a great access to a greater bandwidth, there's a greater truth, we know it, we as individuals are empowered by it. When we start moving out of the light, then what happens is only people with a genetic predisposition to um, a lower resistance to spiritual information get more information. And though that we're moving into the age of the wise women or the wise men. Then as we, it gets a little darker than only those that have pre genetic predisposition and do ritual, okay, which would be shamanism, uh, among other things. 
have access to spiritual information. As we move further, only those that have genetic predisposition do ritual and are cloistered, like your monks have access to the information. And then eventually, in the long dark, we come into a period where nobody has access back. And then what's um, uh, worshipped and held on to are the rituals themselves, with no understanding that they were simply the vehicle to get back to the light. Then we start fighting over what ritual means what and who can do them, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. That's dogma. And it happens to everything. It happens to religion. It happens to shamanism. By the way, shamanism is not a religion. It's just an uh, organized set of rituals. But it's happened to everything, to our education. Everything goes dogmatic. Then when we start walking out of the long dark, the first thing that starts to happen is people that are cloisters, that have a genetic predisposition, that do ritual, can start accessing that information. We're past that point. Then, pretty soon, people that um, have genetic predisposition and do um, ritual can access it. That's the age of the shaman. Eventually, and this is what I love about this, eventually, any of us can access spiritual information. That's the garden. That's the fall, is when we go into the dark. The garden is when we're in the light. And at that point, shamanism becomes obsolete for a while because we have direct connection. That was when man, man was one with God. Okay, that's what all those legends are about. Wow. Um, this is making so much sense to me as well, and I'm, I'm sure that it is to the listeners. It, it's simplicity explained to a lay person <laughs> who has been looking for an explanation for this in a very simple form. And what you've just put across here makes total sense. <laughs> I'm so glad. <laughs> Can you let me know, does shamanism ease, ease suffering? Does, does it make you have the ability to move away from pain and hurt, any of those sort of things? Well, you have to endure a certain amount of pain and hurt to embrace the shamanic way yes. because, you, because you're having to move into your own pain. And we don't want to abolish pain. We just don't want to be controlled by it. So there's this thing, shamanically, particularly in the Celtic tradition, known as the joy and sorrow sine wave. A lot of our suffering is trying to cling to our joy and avoiding our sorrow, or getting lost in our sorrow and never re-entering our joy. Being able to be present in the present moment and fluid and letting those things move through us is what tempers us and allows us to evolve as individuals. That evolution brings peace absolute peace, because you know no matter the circumstances, you can move with the joy, you can move with the sorrow, and you remain. So how can shamanism impact our concept of reality? Um, we live in, in a holographic universe that we actually are mistaking for physical, okay? Our five senses take in frequency information and then translate it in symbols. Those symbols are what we're calling ordinary reality. Um, shaman <laughs> enjoy a reputation for being quite mad <laughs> because they they <laughs> see <lovely>. they, <laughs> yeah, just love it. They, my kind of people see, <laughs> exactly <laughs> they see the energetic aspect of life and recognize that it's fluid and mobile it's not set in stone so as we're able to understand that reality is malleable and we can be part of that equation, then we're suddenly given the ability to manifest the life we want, the world we want, rather than be subject to the things that are finally coming through in physical form that were set up at the quantum level unconsciously, probably by us. That makes sense to me because when I'm, I, you know, I coach in the, in the quantum field and I do what's called vision building and it's, it is the same where you project what you truly want and you you recreate it and you actually live it as if it's really happening. So that, that makes absolute sense to me. It, it is it really it is the same thing. Yeah, yeah. It's the same thing. The, the difficulty is though, we have hidden uh, restrictions and beliefs that impinge our ability to do that. And so if we can be introspective and use these, these skills, these talents to go in and remove those blocks, we become much more effective 
Shamanism works in the dream realm, in the, in the imagination. If you can't imagine a thing, you can't create it because what's going on with your imagination is you're building a matrix at the quantum level around which reality forms. So the, you know, we've been, imagination has been invalidated. Oh, it's just your imagination. Put off kids, you know, oh, get over it already, right? You can't, can't live in a dream world forever. Well, <laughs> the key is we were disabled the minute we bought into that and now re-engaging the imagination. And that's where journey work happens, by the way, is empowering us. It has the power to change the world. It certainly does. So in, in, in reality, everything is created twice. So if you, if you can imagine it and think it, you can create a blueprint and you can live within that blueprint and then that is your life. And that is what you can do. So nobody has to be where they are right now. They can create their reality the reality they truly want, as long as it's a good one as well. I mean, you know, you, well, you create the bad one as well. It's what you do, isn't it? Absolutely. You know, and I think the first step to all of this is recognizing if you're living it, you created it. So, and so if you don't like it, let's uncreate it. There is a caveat on this one too, though. When we dream only half dreams and then go, oh, yeah, but I can't do that. Yeah, but that can't happen. Yeah. We're putting our personal energy into the quantum level and then abandoning it there in these half-formed dinosaurs of intent that were never lived, were never dreamed to their end. So it's important to backtrack and release that energy. Do you believe that successful people, as we see uh, – at- in our human meat suits here on earth, we, we see successful people. Do you believe or do you, do, you, do you think that they have an inkling, an idea on this whole concept that you're speaking about, like Richard Branson and people like that? They've come from nothing into something incredible. I think that they have a natural instinct for the way life works and cooperate with it. Now, there are people like Hitler that, you know, learned the dark arts and yeah, manipulated through it. <laughs> okay. He was successful for a while, but that's sorcery. And when you practice sorcery, it works for a while, but you're working against the laws of nature and there's a nasty backlash. But these people that are just kind of going with the flow and creating something from nothing and it's very altruistic, I think have come here for a purpose at this time. And I think they have a natural ability to, to access and cooperate with the way life works. And that's what I think shamanism can teach your average person to do through these different classes and rituals that are now available. And they're available with this amazing woman as well. <laughs> so you know where to find Gwilda. I'll be leaving all of her links at the bottom of, of, uh, of the podcast post. Gwilda, what's the relationship between shamanic ritual and personal group intent? Mm, okay, that's a really, really good question. The, um, <laughs> go back to sound. If you sound a tone in a t- sound chamber at yeah. a particular volume and a particular wavelength, it has a particular volume. If you sound a second tone at exactly the same wavelength and the same volume, it more than doubles by a lot. It increases exponentially. And that's what happens when you're doing ritual by yourself. You're turning up the volume on your ability to um, work your will in the world. When you do ritual or shamanism in a group with group agreement and good intent, it becomes extremely powerful. And that's going to be one of our saving graces is that they call it the hundredth monkey theory. If enough people start aligning with the way life works and using these principles to boost the amperage, it can change the whole world. We don't need the world to change. With COVID-19, and, and this just sort of popped into my head now, where the whole world is in shutdown, people have started to think the way that you've been explaining as well. More and more people are questioning. And I, I personally see COVID-19 as what very tragic for the people who have passed away and for the families who have had to suffer that. However, it seems to have been something that has stopped the entire planet to rethink and recreate their way and their, and their life paths. Would you, 
Would you agree with that, or would you? What What do you see in this present current time? I've said for years that if we don't change our ways, some herd gleaning is going to happen. Because if we live in an imbalanced way, soon the imbalance comes up with something like COVID-19. Yeah. We were doing habitat encroachment, cruelty to animals, and this disease came from animals, supposedly. Yeah. Okay, And it's a novel disease in that we have no immunity against it. However, it's a, a correction it's a correction in that I'm not saying that people need to die or it should be people dying or this or that, but rather it stopped us in our tracks. It stopped the whole world. And now we're looking at it going, oh, do I really need to drive around like a maniac? Do I really need to buy all these things? What's really important? I'd like to see my people. I'd like, I'd like to, to, to live in a simple enough way that we can be sustained here on the planet rather than be a blithe. And I'm afraid we're going to have a really nasty second wave coming because the, the lesson hasn't been learned. We're seeing by behavior out there that it hasn't been learned. And so here we go again. It's, you know, the escalation of the violence. People have been cooped up. Now they're going hog wild with no good reason. Well, okay, it's going to be, I'm sorry, but survival of the fittest if this continues. The I key hear you is there. living in a balanced way. I hear you there totally. You, you've touched on Hitler and the black arts. And, you know, I think people inadvertently have been practicing, like you say, um, hurting animals, destroying our earth, using certain chemicals and things that we should never have even thought of using. And this is the black backlash. And like you say, the behavior now that's coming from um, the shutdown is not quite how it should be. However, that is moving into the next phase that you speak of. Would you say that worldwide shamanism, the, the, the shaman um, people um, are – are waiting for a second wave? You mean of COVID? Yes. And the whole, yeah. I, I don't know. Um, I don't know. I think each according to their gifts, each according to their limitations. But I do know that there are a lot of people, silent people, sitting in their homes, holding the space in prayer with good intent that are going to rock the world just because of the frequency that they're holding. So all that chaos out there, don't engage. Don't judge it one way or the other. Hold center, hold love, and we are the power that changes things. Yes, we are. And this is where I always recommend to people that I work with is, you know, you don't need to watch the news on 24-7 channels and all the other things that are going with, with, with what's happening right now. So where you say hold that space and be quiet – when you were speaking earlier on of the shamanism requiring heart connection, would that be reflecting and using the heart connection unilaterally, universally, in order to dampen down what's happening now? Actually, I don't see doing it with an agenda, simply doing it to do it. Yeah. And life will create the results that are needed in order to come back into balance. It may not be pretty for a while, but if we can stand and hold center and hold heart for one another and compassion for one another without engaging in the drama trauma, because we don't really know what's going on out there. We're just being fed this mm. big bucket of BS, quite frankly, yeah. on all channels. Damn so we right. can't judge by that. We're not here. We can't see it. We don't know what's going on. We weren't there when it happened, whatever. We're just getting reports, and there's a lot of investment in keeping the drama trauma going. That's what the old system is built on, control through fear. So if we can stay heart-centered and hold that frequency for other people to align to, that's a solution to the problem. It is. It's practicing mindful mindfulness, living in the now, and having unconditional love all the time. Absolutely. What are the challenges now, because we've been touching on that, what are the challenges of entering the Aquarian era and how can shamanism aid the evolutionary process there? 
The major challenges are on looking and unearthing all of our old patterns and restrictions because it takes a lot of introspection and a lot of us are kind of identified with it. There's a lot of guilt and shame surrounding that. Um, And I would say that's the largest challenge as individuals is being willing to roll up your sleeves and look at your stuff and then quit identifying with it step back from it and say, that's not who I was. I, I want I, this, this lovely quote. I can't remember who did it. Black lady. She says, do your best until you know better and then do better. Okay. And that's the walk out is to not judge ourselves, to not go into shame, to not judge other people, but to simply systematically access where we have restrictions against the great, greater uh, increase in volume and frequency so that we can channel this new frequency, this higher frequency into the world. We, the only way to do it is through our bodies. Now, it works through our chakra system and all that to get here, mm. but the bottom line is the more restrictions we have, the light's only as clear as the window through which it shines. So if we can work our stuff, become more aware and self-responsible, we become a light into the world. Certainly do. And that is where your bright white light is of such high importance. It really is. And you shine with that bright white light, Wilga. You really do. Just love you. (laughs) (laughs) Wilga, tell us about your five books. You're very productive. (laughs) (laughs) Well, you know, life is short. I've got a lot to do here, right? (laughs) Children to leave stuff for. (laughs) Bless you. (laughs) Well, the one that you mentioned, so we're still here now, what, uh, Spiritual Evolution and Personal Empowerment in a New Era, speaks a lot about galactic shamanism, but it talks about the way life works and everything else. And it's a bit of a tome. Um, And um, then I have one that's called... um, um, Science of Magic, Book of Mysteries, Volume 1, and that was off of a radio show that I did called The Science of Magic, and it's still you can still access it on my website. Um, but basically, I do a teaching before each show, and so I combined all those teachings into a book, which got great reviews. People really enjoyed that. Then the other books that I've written have been workbooks and texts for the schools and the online classes and all that. So I have a, sh- a workbook on... Um, um, creating sp- sacred space. I have one on journey work. I have one on power animals and helping spirits. I have one on soul retrieval. So that's what the other books have been. Where can people find your books? Well, of course, they're all available on Amazon, but they can also find them on my website, um, findyourpathhome.com, and um, wherever fine books are sold. <laughs> and you need to get hold of them. I'm certainly going to be doing that. They're on my book list. <laughs> uh, your practice, Wilga, what services do you offer? Um, we offer long-distance shamanic healing sessions, and I think the core between behind personal empowerment and personal evolution is being able to, to do the shamanic healing to clear restrictions um, and eventually move to genetic upgrades and remove what doesn't belong, that sort of thing. And um, you can get a hold of that on findyourpathhome.com. We work internationally, uh, either telephone or Skype or Zoom. Um, and then, of course, there's the online classes that we mentioned, and you can also find those at the website, Find Your pathhome.com um, and the books are there and the music oh by the way i do cds i have some journey cds as well as musical cds with the uh, ancient and modern shamanic songs and they're available there as well oh fantastic are you part of them do you do you re- do you chant and do whatever it is that shaman people do <laughs> <laughs> Absolutely, yes. I have two drumming CDs for the Shamanic Journey, and they're, uh, I've played them, I've created them, and they're broken up into a 15 minute journey, 30 minute journey, 45 minute journey, and an hour journey. So you can come and go, as, you know, be, be out there as long as you want, and know you won't miss your meeting. And then um, The Winds of Time is an album that I, I did, the, I do the singing on, along with my partner in crime. Um, my other member of the band, Cody Weigel. And uh, those, I'm a singer-songwriter, and those are all original songs on there. Oh, fantastic. Gwilda, explain your surname, Wiaka. I love it. <laughs> Wiaka. Wiaka is Lakota Sioux, and it means feather. Uh, 
tail feather of the eagle, to be exact, I believe. <laughs> and and my first teacher used to call me Little Wiecka. I never knew what it meant, but feather of an eagle. Thanks, you know. <laughs> but um, when um, when I got divorced from from my husband, but the children's father, I kept his name until he was getting ready to be remarried, and I felt that it would be proper for me to release the name, but I didn't really identify with my maiden name, and I remembered what my teacher used to call me, and so I took it on as mine. I love it. It's just it's just so you. Perfect. <laughs> just <you>. right. <laughs> <laughs> Gulda, I've really enjoyed speaking to you today, and it, you, you've, in the course of this time, you've become a fast friend. You're very, very unique and very special. If you could see this beautiful woman, she looks like a pixie or an elf. She, she comes from something totally ethereal. She's lovely, and her eyes are getting bigger and bigger while I'm saying this. <laughs> but she is, she is amazing, and I highly recommend that you do get in touch with, with Wilga for any of her course, courses, programs, or any of her CDs as well. I, I'm blown away by you, Wilga. You're just amazing. Thank you so much for being on Awaken Your Mind Magic today. It's been an absolute privilege. Thank you so much. been an absolute privilege talking to you, and I'll consider you my friend down under where we hold the, hold the light, we hold the way together. Thank you so much. Namaste. And I'm in your tomorrow already because I am. <laughs> Make good things happen there. I'm counting on you for it. <laughs> I will. I'll be doing that. I'll be using one of your wheels. <laughs> <laughs> Bye now, Wilga. Thank you so much. Goodbye and blessings to you and your audience. Thank you. That's Awaken Your Mind Magic for another week. If anything you've heard today has really impacted you and you want to know more or you would just like to connect with me, then visit my website, awakenyourmindmagic.com and reach out for a free one-on-one -on -one discovery session with me. where I'll be discussing more tools to unlock your dreams and live a limitless life that you would truly love to live. I'm Susan Kathleen, and this has been Awaken Your Mind Magic. <laughs> <laughs>